So I start with the first question, Rob. Uh, could you please tell me a little bit uh, about uh, supported employment in the United States? We spoke a little bit about it in front here. And how big is it? Uh, is it on statewide? And uh, what's the situation for supported employment? Sure. Um, in the United States, supported employment was a very, uh, it started in the early 80s. Okay? And from there, it, got, it was very, very popular. Um, in the 1990s, it, it was growing very quickly, but unfortunately, since then, it's kind of stable, it kind of uh, became uh, stagnant, I guess is the word. It hasn't been growing as quickly. And unfortunately, more and more people are ending up in sheltered workshops than in the community. Um, I think that's going to be changing soon because of environment, uh, economic factors. The uh, United States is in a recession, and both Republicans and Democrats, uh, regardless of, of the right or left, want to spend less money. And they're starting to see that supported employment is, has a better outcome for the taxpayers than other placements. So I'm hoping that soon it starts to change. Uh, the, the amount of money being allocated to both programs, it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I think at some point, we're just gonna be giving it to one program or the other as opposed to trying to fracture the smaller and smaller pie that we have for funding. Um, it, it's still very popular, it's just um, there's a lot of uh, fighting between supported employment and sheltered workshops. It's like, uh, what do we say, like a family reunion, you know, bickering back and forth by a bit. Uh, it's not often a very pleasant type of relationship and it's, uh, you know, it's hopefully that will change at some point. Yes, hopefully. And since these numbers are so good, so the economic effectiveness is very well, it's, it's in itself. Right. I think that, uh, again, certainly there are a lot of people that want to help people with disabilities just because it's the right thing to do. But there's a lot of people that want to do it because it's what we can afford to do. And I think that everybody's kind of starting to come together and realizing that there's only so many things that we can fund with the limited tax dollars that we have. And we're starting to realize that supported employment is the only option, vocational option, that is economically viable in the long term. And that's, it's, it's one of the few things that Republicans and Democrats can agree upon, which is kind of funny. Yeah, yeah. But it, we should also focus on the individual aspect because that's also a very American thing. Right, and, and getting people to work. And yes, it's, it's, it's better to get them work, you know, pull them up by their bootstraps and making them do what they need to do. And, that's, uh, again, the Republicans are very into um, getting people off government payrolls, getting them off of government subsidies. The Democrats are very into, well, let's have people with disabilities be like everybody else. You know, we all work, we all are part of the community, let's get people part of the community. But they're both saying the same things. They will disagree, you know, publicly, but the, behind closed doors they're all saying, you know, we need to, we need to start changing some things. But there's a lot. In the United States, uh, uh, shelter workshops have a, a big lobbyist lobbying group, so they're still very powerful. But yeah. all right, then we skip, go to your questions. Does anyone want to start? Robert, I'm Emil. I come from the Swedish Disability Federation, and we have been working with uh, research uh, and trying to uh, highlight good research that improves participation like this. Yeah. That's very. Uh, interesting to hear. My question is about uh, we now, my, me and my colleague would work with uh, work issues and doing group interviews with persons with disabilities and um, and your rational uh, economic arguments, as you say, you can convince policymakers and politicians and so on. But when it comes to persons uh, with disabilities and maybe their families, parents, and so on. As you indicate, there is sometimes hesitation to take this step uh, to leaving security and so on to, to go to uh, labor market employments and so on. Um, so I wonder how can you argue with it to, to uh, uh, inspire people to take this step that is rational economically. <laughs> well, I, I think, first of all, I don't think we, we need to try to persuade anybody. I, I, like I said, uh, I'm married. I'm happily married. Um, I do what my wife says. Okay. I, I don't have an opinion on anything. My job as a, as a scientist is to give policymakers information so they can make an informed decision themselves. 
I have the same view of parents, that I, my job isn't to convince them or to change their mind, but to instead say, you're concerned about losing government benefits. That's very natural. Right. But, but according to this, for every dollar you're going to lose, you're going to get more than $4 back. I don't want to try to change anybody's mind about anything. It's just um, I want to make sure that you have answers to your questions. For example, the policy people, that, they contact me and ask me these questions. I don't research it and then present it to them. They usually call me up and say, should I fund this program or should I fund that program? But, you know, I think the same I mean, is also for parents, too. I think that we need to get them involved with other parents that have had positive experiences and allow them to communicate. We, as professionals in support of employment, are selling something. We're selling supported employment. We're selling the idea of normalization within the community. When you we're talk to parents, and other parents talk to them, they're not selling things. They're providing their own experiences. They're seeing what has happened previously. Um, pre, what I used to do when I was a teacher, when I was a job coach, a lot of my parents would say, oh, that's good for those kids, but my son is really disabled, or my son can't do that, or he doesn't do this, or he ran out to the street when he was five years old, and I realized that it was 20 years ago. Yeah. But when they talk to other parents, and they see other children that have been successful in the community, they start to see, oh, that's a possibility. Not because I say so, but because they can see it themselves. And I think that's what we need to do. I, think we don't, I don't think we need to convince. I think we just need to show. And I think that tends to be the, most, uh, the, the best way for them. It's, it's, it's their child. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm usually protective of my kids. And you know, I think if you were to try to sell me something about support employment, I'm going to be skeptical because, no offense, you don't care much, as much about your, my child as I do. But other parents feel the same way about their kids. So if you can see what they say, I think it's going to carry a lot more weight. I'm representing the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise, which is a huge bunch of companies in Sweden. And many of them would probably like to hire people with a disability, but sometimes it can be hard to know how to talk about the disability. No. Uh, for myself, I used to work with children with ADHD and uh, those kind of uh, disabilities before I was an economist. And I learned how easy it is to talk about when you have the experience and when you have met people and you know this kind of persons. But if you haven't, then it's really, really, really hard. Um, you have all these <coughs> pictures of what you can say and what you can do. So what is your uh, reflections on, on the employer situation? Well, and I think that's another perspective that we need to focus on. I, as a job coach, I would tell people, like I'd go to a party or a bar and I'd say, oh, I work with people with disabilities. And I think that's wrong. I think that what we should do is say we work with people with disabilities and employers and families and the community. We work for everybody. I don't just work for this, this student. I work with the businesses. I work, help them come up with something that they need. What do they need? They need a good employee that can do the job with as little hassle as possible. And that's what we're providing them. So we're providing them with something that they want. So I, I think it goes to convincing not convince it, but allowing them to see the success stories of other businesses. I go in and try to job develop or job car, and they look at me like, yeah, 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 of course, yeah, that's what you're saying. But if I bring in another employer that they know, and they said, I, we have three supported employees, and this is what they're doing, and this is what it's really helping us in the bottom line, then they tend to listen, because that's their interest. It's not just about helping people with disabilities. They need good employees. Especially in the United States, it's hard to fill some positions that our support employees fill. And that's what we need to do. I'm starting to do some research from the economic perspective of the employers. And one of the things that I'm finding out is that supported employees are better employees economically. They keep their job longer. They miss fewer days in terms of being sick. They rarely have the expensive accommodations that employers always think of. They think, oh, if I hire someone with a disability, I'm going to have to make a ramp here. I'm going to have to take out some seats or whatever it is. That's rarely the case. And the research that's coming out is showing economically, hiring supported employees is financially advisable for businesses. Yeah. Is it economically for employers regardless of what kind of disability, or no. does it, is it affected by the well, kind of disability? Yeah, that's the issue, really, is that uh, you, there's so many different types of jobs, so many different types of disabilities, you have to really look at it in all these different categories. 
all I've really looked at at this point are intellectual disabilities, or what you call uh, learning disabilities, and uh, like fast food restaurants, McDonald's and things. So we still need to do a lot more research to look at broader labor markets and, and other populations to see, is it financially advisable to hire some with autism, or uh, Asperger's, or uh, wheelchair users, those kind of kinds of things. So there's more research to be done, but again, if you have a motivated population that wants to work, I think that's one step up than a lot of other people without disabilities.